السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام Assalamu alaikum, everyone. We'll just give another minute or so, inshallah, for other people to join on, and then we will start from there, inshallah.
Assalamu alaikum, Bibi Khan. How are you? I'm good, alhamdulillah. How are you? Good, good, alhamdulillah. Good to see you all. Yes, same here, alhamdulillah. Hello, Brother Mokhtar, how are you? Assalamu alaikum, Brother Kalim. I'm doing well. Good, good to see you too. Same, same, same here. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so, Brother Mokhtar, we can go ahead and start with you. In the meanwhile, everybody will fill in, inshallah. So, it'll give us a couple of minutes. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah, salatu assalamu ala rasulillah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the community conversations. Inshallah, what I thought I'd do is uh, begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, remind each other of it's always important when we have these types of conversations, we tie it back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran and in, in, in the Sunnah. So we will begin any conversation with the remembrance of Allah. I will. Uh, Inshallah, recite uh, Surah Al-Fatiha and then just uh, open up the floor uh, for the conversation to begin, Inshallah. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Deen إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا الله we begin with your name with your praise يا رب العالمين that Make this a beneficial event for all parents and youth that are joining today, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask this to be an enduring effort where we have various topics we bring to the community and that you made it a, make it a blessed conversation so that we all benefit from it. One of the things I wanted to highlight to you all is that uh, the objective of these conversations is that we wanted to gather the wider community in discussing various topics and uh, today we will be discussing uh, a topic which is uh, near dear to many parents, I would say, including myself, which is the, the parent and the youth divide. Uh, as you can all imagine, and as you go through life, you, especially if you've uh, immigrated here uh, or, or, or thereof, um, there, there are various topics that come to mind, conversations that you have with your youth where perhaps we are not all on the same page. So inshallah, um, with that, I would um, pass it, the mic back to Sister Bibi Khan so that we can uh, you know, benefit from today's discussion on the parent and the youth divide. Over to you, Sister Bibi. Okay, thank you. Jazakallah khair, Brother Muhtada, for that. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. So while other people are getting on, I know um, some people are messaging us that they're joining. Um, I wanted to kind of introduce this program. It's our very first community conversation. And the reason why we think it's really important is because there's a lot of community that does not go to the masjid. They do not hear the khutbahs. They do not go to lectures. And we want to start reaching out to that community also. So I think social media is the place where we can, inshallah, achieve a lot of that. And um, we just want to include everyone into these conversations. So uh, the next one, inshallah, you're going to invite all your friends and everyone to join on. So a bit about the program is that um, we will try to make this as interactive as possible. If you have any questions and comments, there's two ways that you can address those. One raise your hands. Um, if you look on your settings, um, you'll see the option to raise your hands. Please click on that and we will know that you have a question or you have a comment and we will open it up and let you in, okay? Number two is the chat. If you look on there, there's a chat. You can add your question, you can add your comments in there. Um, we do want you to, you know, ask questions. We want you to share um, situations that you may have. The only thing is that if there's a lot of people, it's hard for us to get that. Um, we're hoping to have um, at least 50 people 
so it's manageable and we can all get a chance to talk. So um, we'll limit it to one minute for every um, question or conversation. Um, if it's something else that's bigger, you can always email us at info at anissa.org. If you need a counselor, you need someone else to reply to your questions, please, please do that. It's info at ANNISA.org. Um, okay, the most important part of the program, though, is to stick to the topic of the day. I know we have a lot of stuff we want to dismiss uh, to talk about. There's a lot of stuff that it's bothering us. We're going through a lot of struggles right now. But today, the topic is adult and youth divide. So what does that mean? The disconnect we have between the young people and the adults. That is what the topic is, and we're going to stick to it. If you do have questions on other topics, hold on to them, send them to us at info. But here is the good part. This group will be the deciding factor on the next topic we talk about. So this will be the group that will vote and say, okay, we want to talk about whatever the topic is next, okay? So we'll send you a feedback and you will pick what topic you want us to talk about next month. This will be a monthly um, a discussion, inshallah. And honestly, I'm so excited and so looking forward to us uh, have solutions and come up with things that will make it great. Today we have Safra uh, Khan and Seda Patel who will be moderating who gets to speak and when they get to speak and all of that. So they will be um, helping me do that. So I wanna jump right into the program. So, you know, um, we talk a lot about generation gap, right? Anybody you talk about, they say, oh, it's a generation gap that's causing the problem. But guess what, guys? Generation gap has been in existence since Hazrat Adam's time, okay? Every generation, there's a gap in between, and it's always been like that. So it's not the generation gap that I see as a problem. I think it's the mindset gap. So what do I mean by that? For example, you know, you bring your family from a different country, you bring them to America, you bring them to Canada, wherever you're taking them, and you expect them to be the exact same people as if they were in Pakistan or in Egypt or in you know Turkey, it's not gonna happen. You're in a different country, in a different environment. They go to school, the culture is different in school, the environment is different, but yet the parents want them to behave as if they were back home. So that is not gonna work because 99% of the kids in their school are not from the same religion are not from the same culture, right? So it's there's, uh, that's where all the breakdown actually start. So today, I wanna start off with my question and any of you are um, welcome to ask questions pertaining to this topic, okay? The first question is just so we can start the conversation. My question is one of the most said lines that we hear our mother, our father, our grandparents, everybody says it. It is, I want my children to have what I didn't have. I want them to have all the things that I never had. So I wanna ask everyone today, what are those things? What are those things you want them to have? And also, if you can't give it to them, then what? And what if the kids don't want those same things? So I wanna start off the discussion by talking about that. Um, uh, you know, I'll, anybody who wants to be the first speaker, go ahead, raise your hand or put it in your chat. But I'm going to go ahead and pick Sada Patel because I know she is an expert on this. So Sada, if you can give your one minute, whatever, and everybody else get ready for yours. So your uh, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so maybe your question is, what is it that we want our children to have? And do we know if it's the same thing, right? So a lot of us have become helicopter parents. We want our kids to do well in school. We want them to have all the things that a lot of us didn't have while growing up. So it ends up being you know, it's different for everyone, but it, for some people, it ends up being getting them a phone quickly, getting them a car at 16. I know so many people will, you know, get their teenagers who just learned to drive a brand new car. Um, similarly, like 
you know, there's this pressure in our Desi homes or in South Asian, especially homes for, you know, doing well in school. So you want them to do well, you want them to do particular fields. And I know we make fun of this, but it's something that's very real and very relevant. So the children growing up, we don't realize until they start voicing it when they become teenagers. And so we think, oh my God, they've become, you know, they're, they're talking back to us. They're being so loud to us, but we don't realize that this is something that they never wanted because we never took the time to ask them. And I think that's because of the fact that in our homes, it was never considered something that's important to ask. You know, it was never considered important to find out for a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure it's different. I'm not generalizing completely, but I'm talking generally in the sense that for most families, more than the average, um, you feel that, you know, you were never asked and you did what you were told. So our children should do the same, but it's not the same. The so social media, um, you know, information, the, the impact, you know, impact of all this information we're getting, um, the fact that the world is really a small world now, all of this together is creating a whole different set of ideas and a different set of things that children want, the things that people want, that we are not aware of, because we're not moving in that same direction. We've stopped ourselves, we paused ourselves. And sometimes we have that fear that our children are losing their culture. So we try to impact that, implement that more, more than people in the home countries. You know, we have more strictness, more conservativeness than people in the home countries. And I think I've taken up my minute. I have too much to say about this, but I'd love to hear from everybody else. Um, you guys, if you can put it in the chat, if you can raise your hands, let us know what you think, what your children think. So we'll start with um, brother, uh, our sister, Saladin, and then Saira, you're next. Yes, Salaam Alaikum, everyone. Um, I, I, um, me and my sister, I had a gathering yes last night actually, and we were talking about this, like this division between parents and children, and we came up with this word, um, cultural parenting. I'm African American. I was born and raised here. This is my home, you know. Uh, but I was born and raised Muslim. I didn't convert or revert to Islam. My parents raised me as Muslim. But with my kids, I feel the disconnect. You know what I'm saying? I don't know because you know how I was raised, um, how my parents raised me. You know, whatever they said, there was like like the other sister was saying before, no questions about what I wanted to do or my ideas, our opinions about things, I was just told what to do and how to do it, you know? So when it comes to this generation, they have their own ideas and their own way of thinking and the way that I was brought up culturally and how my parents were brought up culturally was the same way. I don't know how to connect with my kids and ask them like, what are your ideas about things? How are you thinking about things? So I think it transcends uh, more than Pakistani culture or Turkish culture or anything like that, even with African-American culture being brought up here, we have certain Islamic values um, that our kids, all of these outside influences, they're not getting. Um, and I don't, I have a hard time with connecting with them too. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, it, it, I know it's not answering your uh, question, Sister Bibi, but I, I just wanted to make that comment that it doesn't matter if, you know, we're from Pakistan or anywhere else, even yeah. African-Americans born and raised here who are Muslim too, a born Muslim have this issue as well, yeah. or yet any other, um, you know, maybe Hispanic Americans or um, Caucasian Americans who are born Muslim too. We have this issue with our children as well. Yeah, I think, I think you're definitely correct. It's across the board that we all go through this. So we'll let um, everybody who has their hands up finish and then we'll come, we'll talk about what are the solutions? How do we actually connect? So Saira, you go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, so Bibi, I've, uh, as you said, like we want to have them to have things that we didn't and we want to do that for, but I think sometimes what, mistake we make is that we do it for them we mm. didn't like like let them chance to have it on take the ownership like just buying a car and giving to a kid is always in any culture is going to be like causing problem 
if he makes effort to get that car and you know have some ownership then he's going to treat that car differently and it is for everything even like in our like work line like if we do everything for kid, like anyone it's not going to have the same value if they put their effort in that it can be anything like a phone a laptop or anything and it also like creates a connection between us and them you know i agree i definitely mm -hmm. agree that there has to be tyra you're up next you're on mute you're on mute sister tyra sister tyra you're on mute you're on mute sister tyra Yes, dear, I can hear you. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Too much pressure there. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. One thing we have to remember, you know, when I, I'm a first, a first generation immigrant, and my kids grew up over here. So a lot of things that you're talking about, you know, it, it really, you know, resonates with me. One point that I would like to make it very clear as a parent is, is that our children are, yes, a part of it, but they are not an extension of us. That's, that's one thing we have to remember. We don't fulfill our needs through them because you have to be conscious of their needs. That's what makes you a conscious parent. Conscious parent is a one who is aware of and is a con a conscious about the, the, the child's needs not fulfilling your needs like you know you you want your child to be a typical you know they see engineer doctor whatever it is you can't you know uh, project that on the child and make the child live a life which you never had another thing that i hear a lot is that they kind of do this guilt the parents a lot of parents i work with you know families is that they um they guilt trip the children into saying that we came to America because we wanted you to have a better life. But see, what are you teaching your children? You're not teaching exactly what, you know, Sarah was saying is, you're not teaching them to take, be accountable for their, your own act. You made a decision to come to America mm -hmm. or any part of the world because whatever it is your reason was, you don't take that on the children and tell them and guilt them, guilt trip them saying that, okay, it's because, you know, we came here because of you. So this kind of, you know, has a different, uh, very, very negative reaction when it comes to the children. And they're like, okay, then we don't have to do anything. You do everything for us. Um, I've got a lot more to say, but you can go ahead. My minute is up. <laughs> okay, but that's an excellent point. Yeah. I, I love that, yeah. Um, Fissa, I know you have your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Hey, let's not make up everybody. So um, my name is Fiza. I'm also one of the youth therapists at Anissa, and I am also a school counselor in a public school. So uh, my focus would be, we're talking about things the kids can have. I feel like we need to more worry about, you know, you think about, oh, my kid, I, I didn't have this, so I'm going to give my kid this. Rather than focusing on that, I think what we need to do is just give them a good foundation let them ask you for what they want because they have to learn to ask. They can't just, don't just give them something because then they don't learn the value of asking. And, and sometimes you need to say no because guess what? They need to hear that too. So my, my thing was my parents, because I came here when I was very young, grew up here. I had my kids, I raised them. One of them is married. So, you know, it's like we were like the second generation, you could say. Um, so what I've learned is I don't focus. I never focused on what my kids want in a, like material things. It was more like give them a good foundation so they can actually make good choices and ask for things that they need rather than thinking about, oh, I want a new car. Well, you know what? No, <laughs> you know, so you have to kind of set those standards if you want your kids to be a certain way. That's it. Excellent. Um, Amen. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Okay. Um, so I'm a therapist at Anissa, but I also have three boys, mashallah. So basically the pattern that I've seen is um, being uh, too religiously strict, not allowing the kids to have the freedom to uh, or a safety 
to learn about you know uh, you know others and uh, basically going to parties or interacting socially uh, because I mean I grew up here I mean I came as a, a teenager and so the way I grew up was I made my own choices and decisions I started wearing hijab I was basically made my own choices but being too religiously strict constricts the kids and they start exploring other things. And um, another issue is the disconnect between uh, the father and the mother. So let's say the father is too religiously strict and the mother is okay, she's practicing Muslim, but being too religiously strict like constricts the, uh, you know, restricts the mom from teaching kids uh, other values. So, and um, another problem is lack of balance. So we need, Islam is all about balance. So being in the middle is what's gonna create that uh, peace. And so if, there, if there's no balance, then the kids will be definitely imbalanced and disconnected. Okay, so I just, before uh, Sister Farnaz, I call on you. Um, one thing I wanna make clear is that our religion is not difficult. Okay, the religion itself is very, very easy to be a Muslim. The problem is when we bring culture, we bring all this, you know, the wishes that we wish our kids can be perfect. And we, you know, we put so much strain and burden on our children at times that it's it sometimes it's unfair to them. And honestly, I'm speaking as an advocate for the children right now, where I have seen them, uh, how is it even, humanly possible that we send them to like 20 activities they have no time to breathe no time to grow they're in all these sports they're in, you know quran classes every day da, da, da. they have no time to actually ever be a child and then we look back at them and we're like oh my god they never had a childhood yes they didn't because we enforced too much on them iman and i i agree with you on that that's definitely a, a big problem um sister Farnas, go ahead please Assalamualaikum. First of all, thank you, Sister Bibi and Sadaf and everybody for creating this beautiful forum for us to share our thoughts and alhamdulillah, you know, talk about some of the current issues and you know, alhamdulillah, come up with some solutions. So my comment will basically just extend what Sister Bibi already said. Um, I'll share my insight as an educator, which I, when I see children, you know, 500 students in a day um, and subhanAllah, how unrealistic, unrealistic parents can be sometimes in their expectations of them. I think the main issue here is acceptance, not just generation gap. Us mm -hmm. accepting children as individual human beings instead of trying to live our dreams through them. I've seen Hufaz, subhanAllah, trying to just break the chains and, and run free because this just feels too constricted. I've had students in my school who just try to sneak in devices so they can huddle and they can see stuff because they're not allowed at home. So I think the main issue here is acceptance, accepting children as they are, not trying to live your dreams through them giving them some space and having those real conversations with them, trying to understand where, what they want and where they're coming from, inshallah. I think my minute is up, thank you. That's good. Um, there's someone who, ha uh, is that, someone, mm. uh, iPhone, there's no name on there. Do you, you can go ahead. It says iPhone on there. Um, we can't see a name. I, I don't know who this is. Okay, let's skip over you for a minute. Uh, Brother Suhail, you're next. Hey, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Yes, I oh, wanted Fiza. to extend um, what Fiza said about, you know, letting the kids ask. So what I wanted to say is that obviously each one of us has different parenting style, right? But what I or what my wife and I try to do is tie those incentives to something, right? So instead of just giving them, just remind them you're earning it through X, Y, Z. So to give you an example, my daughter's iPhone uh, was broken. She had iPhone 10 and she had you know, dropped it, cracked the screen, cracked the camera, and she kept complaining about it. But I didn't just get her a new phone just because even though it's a necessity. At the end of the school year, she got all A's, alhamdulillah. And she also uh, took an AP course while she's in ninth grade. Um, and she also got an A in that college level class. So at that point, I tied the new phone to those achievements and the high grades that she had. So next time, it's not just I got you a new phone because you needed iPhone 13 or 14, whatever I got her, uh, but rather you achieved it because you got the phone because achieving these results. So I think tying them to something 
to behaviors and, and you know, other accomplishments, I think that definitely helps. Okay. So that is a very important part, which we as parents, especially immigrant parents, and I think Muslim parents in the whole, is that we, you know, it's called fair consequences, you know, um, and I think we need to do one of these sessions on fair consequences, because we do not even realize that the kids are sometimes feel entitled because we give, give, give. And sometimes they don't even do simple thing as chores at home, right? So I think one of the topic is definitely fair consequence. There's so much great material on that. Um, inshallah, we'll talk on that. Okay, Sister uh, Rabia and then Farzana is next. Um, so my point is like, you know, there are things that I, agreed with everybody what everybody said and there are things that i did not agree with um like for example for consequences and for things like you know how we see as parents um so my main point is like you know having the right kind of communication with the kids i want my kids to like have the things that i had it was more like on the other side like the autonomy to choose what career i wanted to go in um you know the things that I wanted to have, um, all those things that I had, like, you know, the freedom, uh, the ability to speak up in front of my parents, the ability to share my advice or my, my voice whenever there was an important decision being made in the house. I wanted my kids to have those. But I think in the end, it was like the right communication from my parents that I want to have with my kids. Um, and I, I believe, I hope I did a good job with that, that my kids can stand up in front of me and tell me that I'm doing something wrong. Um, what I do not see, um, I have not uh, like seen many um, kids from Desi backgrounds, but I have seen kids from other backgrounds. Um, again, like every household or every parent has a different way of disciplining that would suit their needs, they, that would suit their household culture or, you know, their household culture itself. So, you know, hoping that the, the kids are involved in the decision of what should be the consequences and what should be the discipline techniques mm -hmm. that would help the kids to achieve their best. Because and, and to me, in the end, it's just like, you know, connecting the kids to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not controlling the kids for my sake. Uh, like, you know, they should not be fearing me because if they just fear me, they'd be doing those things outside my, you know, supervision. So connecting them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not controlling. And again, like, you know, having the best communication possible with them uh, and involving involving them in all the decisions, um, even regarding the discipline. Jazakumullah khair. I, I definitely believe that the kids should choose their own consequences, 100%. It makes it, then they stick to it, they value it, and then we have less work to do, to be honest. Okay, um, Farzana, you're next. Farzana? Okay. Farzana, you're okay, on mute. Sorry, oh, she got it. sorry. <laughs> Um, I just, I wanted to add, I agree with a lot of everyone is saying, but I think one thing that I experienced was because my parents were really strict. I think I started off being a very strict parent. So for me, it, my problem was I said no a lot. So I think it was more like, because I didn't do it and my parents didn't allow it, um, you're not going to do it either. And I think that that was something that I had to learn, um, you know, with from parents who were you know, around me who had older kids, um, like my sister and other people. And they were like, okay, well, there's no strategy that you have, you know, because you want them to be religious or because I came into religion or the way I wanted to practice religion a little bit later in life. So I was like, no, I want my kids to start really, really young, you know, so, or that, well, I never went, you know, out to the mall to hang out with my friends. My mom didn't allow that. So you guys aren't going to have it too, because I, you know, turned out okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I grew up here, so I think I found myself saying no too much um, until the very first time, and I've shared this with Sada before, when the very first time my daughter lied to me. And it was about something she had done. It was something very simple, not a big deal, but she told me she didn't do it because she was like, she, I'm going to get in trouble. And I think that was my kind of moment of, you know, awakening, thinking, okay, well, you know, I, I have to change something. 
So I, I, I just had a different perspective because we, we were raised in a really strict environment. So I think that sometimes we're too strict with our kids um, and then maybe lax on things that we shouldn't be. And I really agree with, um, I think it was Rabia, um, communication is so important. You know, just, how, just talking to your kids. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, point. Excellent. That is a, a great point, uh, Farsana. Um, we'll try again with the person who is, a, they have no name. It just says iPhone. Can you go ahead? And I just sent you a private chat to um, iPhone. Too, yeah. okay. Um, okay. All right. So, um, can uh, Sister um, Saluddin, do you have something to say, or was that from before your hands were up? No, Salahuddin. Yeah, I did. I did have something to say. Okay. I was wondering, um, Sister Iman, I think her name was. Um, she was saying that don't be religiously too strict, and so I was just wondering if she could give us an example of what that looks like, especially with all of these outside influences. Um, you know, coming at our kids that are un-Islamic, how do we, <clears throat> how does she suggest that we strike this balance, like a real concrete example in trying to implement Allah's word and Allah's law? And at what age do we <laughs> like release our kids? Like, you know, kids, they don't make rational decisions, you know, so we're there as parents to guide them and direct them. So how does it look? How does this balance look? I'm just curious. Uh, thank you. Um, what your name, please? What's your name? Uh, Atiyah Salahuddin. Atiyah Salahuddin. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So um, one thing that, as I grew up here, uh, one thing that we were doing, we we had a group of friends, and so we would hang out at home, uh, do parties at home. For example, if you want to go to the swimming pool, you go with a group of friends that you know. You know their their parents, their background. So, because you, you, I mean, at what age would be like starting from seven, eight, nine, you wanna do these hangout social events with the kids because the kids need to have their friends around. They wanna eat together, they wanna have fun. So there is always a badil in Islam, means like there's an alternative, subhanAllah. So there is a halal and there's a haram. So when you say no all the time, please find an alternative. Because mm -hmm. if you find an alternative, that's a safety cushion for the, the kids to like, oh, you know, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, I can go to this place, hang out. Uh, I can go to trampoline park and hang out. It's uh, or a swimming pool or have a party at home. Mama can make uh, food and invite everybody and play uh, together. So if moms can do that between each other and say, hey, one day at my house, the other day. At so the, the kids feel they have fulfilled their emotional need and need to socialize and be happy. And that's how I grew up. So that's okay. one. Jazakallah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, Tamsila? Assalamualaikum. So I wanted to add, I agree with a lot of what, you know, we're talking about here. I wanted to add, um, the communication is the key, you know, asking our children why when we're, especially when we're in a disagreement state, asking them why and trying to understand what it is, you know, that uh, is causing the conflict and having them come to terms. And I also wanted to add like uh, a few parents mentioned uh, uh, consequences and incentives. Yes, that's important. Like, I mean, I will share my personal example. My son, his grades were dropping. And he was saying, you know, his, his was like, well, you don't understand how middle school is hard and there's a lot of social pressure. And I'm like, I understand because I grew up here. So I understand, but I also know your potential. So my expectations of you is not something, it's not because like, I want you to get A's. It's because I know that you can do this in this area. So making that or having that communication helps and putting those incentives in place and also like one of the things that I do with, you know, my children is when I get really frustrated or when, excuse me, sorry, go back and see. I'm sorry, one second. <laughs> sorry about that. I was hiding, but my three-year-old found me. <laughs> so, um, so like I will have him come up with uh, three to four like have him brainstorm a list of consequences that I think that's going to have him reflect. 
So I'll have mm. him actually make a list that gives him a whole um, different avenue to process, yeah. you know, what led him there and what he could be doing differently uh, without yeah. me having to scold him and, you know, punish him and take away his things. That's so, um, you know, like I, like I said, also letting him choose or making that list. And then I will tell him in the end, I get to decide which consequence I think is appropriate, but at least he's had a chance to put a thought to what he thinks would be a good consequence for something that he went out of line for, you know? And then we also talk about why it was out of line. Good. Excellent. Um, I, okay, so the, I want us to start thinking about the next thing I really want to talk about is how much we think about what people think of what we do and how we, we raise our children. So keep that in the back of your mind. There's two people still have their hands up. Um, so I'll go to Ruksar, Ruksar and then to uh, Sister Mangala. Go ahead, Ruksar. Uh, um, Salam alaikum. Um, I'm not a therapist or anything, um, but I'm in my 30s and growing up here. Um, so quickly, I had two points. Um, I think we keep talking about communication with parents, and I think communication is basically becoming their best friend um, and not constantly giving them consequences. Um, or saying like, if you mess up, this is what this is what will happen. I think a lot of parents don't realize that we don't give room to kids to make an error. Um, that we don't have, we we can't make mistakes. Um, and if we make mistakes, then you know they don't they give a silent treatment. They don't talk to us. They just literally like close us out in that sense. Um, and then the other point was that the standards or expectations of parents are too high for us. For example, growing up, even in fourth grade or fifth grade, if I got an A, my mom was like, why not an A plus? Um, but even achieving that A, rewarding them in that sense will actually help them get an A plus instead of saying, no, I want this, then you will just lose interest in it and wanting to do that because then it will be an out of fear of your parents instead of wanting to do it yourself. Um, that's all I had to say for this discussion. Excellent point, Ruxar. Thank you. Okay. Sister Mangala? Hi, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I grew up here and I just wanted to kind of say just like a couple things that my parents did that really help me to understand how to connect with my kids is um, they would, you know, they were very strict with me. I didn't get to go socialize with, you know, friends from school and things like that. And of course I didn't like that, but I always had friends in, you know, in our own culture where we used to go every weekend or my cousins or, you know, we had a lot of family around. And I think that really helped me to, you know, at least I had that you know, that kept me strong. And, you know, I got my social interaction that way. And also, they gave me the freedom, like, even though they were strict with me, you know, I was able to speak up and say, hey, you know, I don't really like this, you know, they allowed me to do that. And picking my own career choices and things. And I think it's really important to go to, you know, your country very often. So they, so your kids kind of get to see you know, that culture, and then they, they kind of understand where you're coming from, you know, because they, they see it regularly. So I think that's really important, like summers and holidays to really try to connect with your, your family back home. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, okay, so, the, okay, there's a few people still wanting to talk on this topic. So two more will take Nafiz and Salva, and then we'll talk about um, what people think or what people say. Go ahead, Nafis. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I do have young kids, one's almost a teenager. So, you know, I, I find it very hard um, to, you know, and I feel like I'm learning um, with time. You know, I feel like what we have uh, right now, the generation's different, you know, AI progressing, um, iPads, I feel like us as grown adults, we feel lost, you know, in our phone for a while. Sometimes I find myself, you know, if I start navigating, you know, just spending so much time and 
that is very important to them because that's one way of communication for them. Um, and they, it's very frustrating because nowadays that's what the kids want, right? I mean, that's how they connect with each another. So, you know, balance is the key, but also I feel like, you know, having just, um, you know, just as a parent, I feel like finding the friends that we want or the parents that have the similar parenting really helps with the kids that have the same parenting, uh, you know, style. So I feel like that helps. Uh, that has been helping me, you know, just finding, you know, just similar parenting, you know, parents just doing play dates, uh, you know, just keeping them a little away from, you know, and just having these discussions with the parents. Oh, you know, just we kind of bring it up. So I think that really helps the kids understand that they're not the only ones that are being restricted. Um, and there's other parents also. I agree. I agree on that. And I think a big thing that we need to do is also know our kids, their friends, know their friends and know their family. Mm -hmm. It's important to intermingle with those people because honestly, you, you'll be surprised what we may think people are great, you know, great role models or whatever, and you'll be surprised. So I agree with you. You have to have like-minded uh, uh, group of friends. Mm -hmm. Salwa, you're next. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I, um, I keep hearing communication. And for me, to me, is communication is on the top of the list. But I am going to bring two kind of new points. The first point is uh, turning, the, turning the action into the parents' field. And instead of focusing on the kids, uh, what the kids want, what the kids need, I would say the parents start with by them with themselves being respectful, to be respected by their kids and to, to be up to the standard, education-wise, intellectuality, uh, social, uh, interacting with their kids and with the people around them. They will be a role model where the kids look up to them and that will be very, not very easy, but it will be easier for the kids to respond and to take from their parents because they, they hold them in a higher standard than other people. Uh, this is the first one. And, and that will also involve parents being fun, being curious, open-minded, and have good listening ears to attentively listening to their kids and their needs and evaluate their, these needs and seeing this can happen, this cannot happen. And also wants are very important. So we usually look at the kids, okay, the needs are important to fulfill, but the wants are not. But actually the wants could be needs for kids. The second point is, um, oh my gosh, I, I forgot that one. But this is, this is the one that I wanted to emphasize more. Oh, the second one is being our kids shepherd, not, uh, not the fixer. So this is a term that I like to use to be a shepherd when we're dealing with our kids. Mm -hmm. Our kids are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a certain way that not maybe similar to us, but they're just unique. So, and they inherit all of these generational issues and attributes from parents, grandparents, environment, uh, great grandparents, whatever. So we have to look at our kids and say, okay, how can we guide them to navigate through their life and to provide the best for them to be the best, not to fix them and to not to make them do things that we want them to do. So this is, this is Excellent. Thank you. I, I, I love that. I think oh, that's so important. And, and definitely being that shepherd is, is really, I think we need to go back to that because we were there before. We lost all of that, right? Coming mm -hmm. here. And a big thing about why we have lost that shepherd, I'll be honest with you, is CPS. A lot of people are so terrified of CPS that, oh my God, if I say something to my kids, if I do, it, you know, you can, if you're going to be scared of your kids, you're not, you can never be a good parent. That's all I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. Um, there's Mariam. Go ahead, please. Hey, hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, yeah, so that's a good point for CPS. I just wanted to relate something uh, to nowadays. Like, if we are going to think about our grandparents and our own parents, they have been, uh, let's think about the job. 
So when they were uh, doing their job, right, when they were working, they had a boss and they had to do what their boss w- would tell, uh, tell them. Because at that time it was like this, they didn't have a choice. So, but now it's so hard, like the turnover, whenever you have a, someone apply for job, it's not that they're going to uh, stay there forever. You know that they're going to leave. Why? Because they have an option. So it's the same with the kids. Like uh, if you think about the past, uh, our parents and grand, they didn't have a, an option. That's why they stayed there, even if they didn't like the boss and they couldn't speak up or they couldn't tell their uh, opinion. But now it's different. It's like, if you don't like your job, you can quit it and find another job. Or you can always uh, go to HR and say, hey, my boss is just doing this and this and this to me. They are discriminating me. So because nowadays I think kids have a lot more options. They have CPS, Mm -hmm. they have, uh, they're seeing, they're hearing a lot of different things. So it's like, we need to be careful, yes, but we should also not um, compare our kids to how we were brought up. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into something um, else that's very important that we see at Anissa a lot also, is people worrying, parents worrying about what people think and preventing their kids from getting the help they need. This is um, across the board, okay? And whether it's something like their kids are depressed, they will be in denial until the end of time that no, there's no such thing as depression. Um, The kids are failing in school instead of getting them into tutoring, they'll be no, 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 we can't do that. You know, you have to do better. So this has been a um, a big thing that we have seen that people worry too much about what other people think. And in Urdu, Sadaf, what is it in Urdu? What will people uh, think? Kya ke- kya kehenge. And Iman in Arabic? It's, uh, I don't know exactly the words in Arabic, but hashma, like shame, basically. Being too ashamed of telling people uh, that they have a problem. Yeah. So because of Bibi, this- uh, one somebody in the, so, oh, so, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Salaf, go ahead. I was saying somebody in the chat said that please get the youth opinion. So do we wanna- Okay, so any okay. of the youth, I mean, the youth are here, they can speak up, you know, that, that's the thing, right? Like they, we, we're giving them independency. So go ahead, if any of the young people would like to address any of the things we have said so far, please jump in. I think Ruxar was one of the youth that made excellent points about what she felt as her parents. So we are, we are getting the youth opinions for as a response to the chat. Yeah. Um, but anybody else, any other youth that would like to speak up about the issues they have with us as parents, <laughs> please do. Yes, Marina. Assalamualaikum. Okay, so a huge thing that I noticed growing up is any one of my friends or myself, if we were sad or depressed or had any emotion other than being grateful for having a roof over our head, having food, having clothes on our back, being able to, our parents to take us places or take us out, they believed depression is because you don't pray enough. And the amount of times that it destroyed half my friends and even myself, I'm like, oh, I feel sad. They would be like, no, like you're not praying namaz enough. You're not reading Quran enough. Like that's a huge issue. Even now I still hear it. So that until I started working with Anissa or like volunteering, only these women I know believe in mental health as Muslims because everyone else is like, no, you need to go to more lectures, start watching Umar Suleiman, even Ramadan. They're just not understanding how therapy is with Islam, how important it is to take care of our brain and our health and and how we you know, look at life because Islam is our life, but we have to make sure that we're also taking care of our heart. And it goes hand in hand. Islam is in our heart, but we get lost sometimes in our work. Like when we're young, we want to go out, everyone's going clubbing, partying. And so they hide that from their parents. And when they're in college, they're a completely different person. They're, they have no idea how to handle being by themselves. They're used to their parents yelling at them and telling them that they're not right. So I think 
mental health for, I guess, first generation parents, it just doesn't exist. Even, I still don't know any women other than Anissa that believe in therapy. So I think that's just my one minute. It's hard to explain to them that it's important that you have to take care of your your mental health. That's therapy. That's part of your yourself. Yeah. So I think Dr. Hamdan um, introduced to our community spiritual bypassing. And I, honestly, I think it's very important for us to all learn about that. Of course, our religion is the most important. But with religion, we also have techniques that we have to use to survive right and i agree with you people do not you can be the most depressed person and the parent they're gonna think you're lazy or you just don't want to get up mm -hmm. and do anything and that is very very draining for a young person even for uh, uh, not even a young person uh, anybody if you're somebody's just you know never uh, validating the way you feel or what you're what's going on it's not gonna work you know what i mean so mm -hmm. okay i'll go to sister ayat Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Omnia and I am Sister Ayat's daughter. Um, I happened to pass by while listening to you guys um, talk and I just wanted to state that I feel like a reason that there's also like a super huge generational divide between um, this generation and past generations is that um, I feel like before the passing down of generational trauma was not something that was truly acknowledged at all. I feel like a lot of parents took the negative and positive aspects of their parents, um, of their parents' teachings to them, and they passed that down to their children without truly acknowledging the um, the negative effects of what their parenting their parenting styles taught them because that's what they thought was right. So I truly believe that in like nowadays, there's more of acknowledgement. But, uh, on like what that looks like, what generational trauma looks like and what negative effects of certain parenting styles do to children. And I don't think that was something that was looked at before. I don't think there were psychological studies on how um, abuse and not really, I'm not like tr like extreme abuse, but just simple, mm -hmm. simple verbal abuse styles. Abuse. Yes, like verbal abuse to your children or just, never really acknowledging them as um for the things that the positive things that they do and only ever focusing on the negative just mm. small things like that i don't think were ever really truly acknowledged by society in general i think that was something that we all overlooked because at the end of the day our children were still fine by the end of the day they weren't committing suicide um or they weren't you know doing extremely crazy outrageous things they were just you know doing things that we found a fix for if that makes sense for example oh thank you so um i just wanted to say that <laughs> excellent that such excellent. An excellent yeah i agree with that that's excellent uh, excellent way of looking at it okay um our our fana yes that's like i'm everyone um, yes, I also grew up here and I had very strict parents. Actually, my parents were working all the time. I think that's a big issue here, too, that we expect our kids to be perfect, but yet we don't have time. I feel like I when I became a parent, I decided that I was going to actually undo everything that my parents, you know, didn't or do whatever my parents didn't do for me. And that style worked pretty well. I keep it a balance. I would like since growing up here, I can understand where the kids, there's so much pressure, peer pressure, all kinds of stuff. I think the key is to be friends with your kids. And even bet, um, more important than that is to be friends with their friends. So I agree with all the parents that said, you can mix both cultures. Um, but, you know, like, let's give you an example. Like, you know, there's proms, there's parties, there's sleepovers. You can with them, like you can have your own parties at your own home. So the kids won't feel like they're being left out. And even when my kids are growing up, it might sound silly, but I even did an Eid Santa, you know, instead of being a regular. Okay. I think you she... have to be a great mom to your kids. You can't just tell them what to do, but you have to abide by what to do. Like, you know, being honesty, integrity, those kind of things are very, very important to me. And I hopefully, inshallah, I pass it down to my kids, you know, so 
like I said, just be a great role model, be friends to your kids and give them time. That is the most important thing. Talk to your kids. That's why. Safra? Sorry, I can't raise my hand because I'm the host, but um, I wanted to say that I think that a lot of parents use the term be friends with your kids. And I think that a lot of times it kind of gets misconstrued, right? Because you can't become too much of a friend to your kids because then they won't listen to you, right? So I think the term that we really need to start using is just showing up for your kids, right? I think that's very, very important. Um, you know, there's a lot of like TikTok videos and stuff going around about how a child's whole just demeanor changes like when they're at a school event or when they're walking for graduation and then they see their parents in the crowd or you know they see people who are really there for them right and I think this goes along the board of pretty much everything that a parent-child relationship is right if a child knows you're constantly there for them they're gonna come to you regardless so I just think yeah. we should change up the wording a little bit on that so that's an excellent point mm -hmm. because we want our kids to come to us instead of going to kids that are their own age, you know, who knows nothing. It's like someone is, is, is contemplating having marital issues, but they go to a single person who's never been married for advice. It's not going to work. So if we can be open with our kids, like all the things we've said today, communication, you know, being able to just understand our children, understand their needs, understand where they're coming from. I think if we can be that and be that role model for them. They will come to us. Why wouldn't they come to us, right? Why would they go outside and ask their friends, okay, I'm having this problem, tell me what to do. If you're 16 and you're going to a 16 year old for advice, and right away, that is the problem right there. Okay, um, uh, sister, I, I I think your name is Atia Salaudin. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yeah, you got it this time. <laughs> uh, Salaam alaikum. Yeah, I just wanted to, someone, I don't know who it was, but they made a very good point about allowing our kids to make mistakes in a safe environment. So, you know, me and my friends, we talk a lot and we're like, oh, you know, I, I have this conversation with my best friend, actually, like she, um, wants to control every aspect of the child's life. And, and I'm like, that's great and everything, but what about when you do, when they do go off to college and they're not used to having you there to do that and they're making their own decisions um, about certain things. So, you know, you don't want a child who's one way in front of you. This is my greatest fear. Mm -hmm. I have five kids um you know one way in front of you because you're dictating every single thing that they do and then when they're they go off to college and then they're not you're not there to do that anymore for them and now they're making their own decisions and they're not used to being in, in that position they're another person you know mm -hmm. and then the whole maybe the whole shame um of what decisions they may be making fall on them and so when they come back to you they're another person so they're living this multiple personality yeah. And so I think it's very important for us before we release them, because, you know, even though some of us may not want to allow our kids to go off to college, the reality in this society, a lot of kids do, and they're away from us. And so when they're still with us and they're still listening to us under our control, allow them to make some of those mistakes with the safety net around them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a such a good point, yeah. Sister Ayat, because honestly, um, what a lot of the parents are the last to know about their kids double personalities. A lot of times they have no idea. They're like, they're the ones that are telling everyone, oh, my child is so perfect. You're doing everything wrong and come to find out that it's their child that that has issues. And you such an excellent point about the double personalities. And that is a big fear for, mo for most parents, but they don't realize when it's happening. Yeah. But also there's another aspect to this whole double personality thing. And that is when the parents also have a double personality. In the masjid, mm -hmm. there's somebody else, right? At work, there's somebody else. And at home, they're a monster or, you know, whatever. So this happens. I mean, in the masjid, oh, you know, like so nice. Oh, Mary John, oh my, you know, my, you're so nice to your kids. And the minute you get home, you know, you're on it with them. So the, these, you know, we do have a lot 
lot of double standards, honestly. And I think along with communication, one of the things we need to be teaching and learning is how to drop that double standard behavior with everybody, with spouses, with your children, with everybody, your friends, everybody. Okay, so um, Shayla, you can go next. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum sir. So, um, the the point you just raised, that's I'm gonna talk about the double personality. And uh, the my one question is, uh, especially, uh, like you know that the parents two type of parents definitely in the same home. They have a different standard. They have followed the different parenting. You, they are not in the same page. And uh, the mostly that happen, like you said, uh, one parents in monsters and one, the other parents in like, you know, they have to stay with the monster, some consequences, like mostly the women. And they want to defend the kids and the life and the marriage and go together, you know, everything's. And uh, like in my household, being honest with you guys, is same thing like going on and going, keep going on. But um, the kids, got the double personality because they have a two kind of parents in the home. So sometimes they become a monster too. They adopt the one parent and they sometimes they want to do being good. So I don't know if in this situation, like what the parents have, like like me, I want to be changed my house environment. Like uh, the, what the kids doing, one parents don't care. He just making money, keep coming home, eating and just do whatever he wants. But the, mostly like I think, mom's more worried about the kids or what's going on but she can't get away the house because she don't have a opportunity to out from the house so in this situation how they can be keep positive with the kids because when they become a teenagers and the time they don't want to listen to them anymore and they say oh hey mom why you do that why you don't take a divorce but the time now we are going out and the woman think, oh, everything are now, I want to save my life because of the kids. Um, but now his kids say, you are the wrong mom. You can take a divorce. You can leave this man. And now right. she's, so that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's hard situation for the kids. They don't want to leave the house because they are 18, but they want to go because they don't want to suffer like a mom. Okay, so um, I, one important thing that we all have to remember is that each and every one of us is responsible for the children in the same way. Each parent is responsible in the same way. So in order for us to be great parents, first and foremost, we have to be a great person. So we have to be the best person we can be. We have to be empowered because a person who is not empowered cannot raise proper kids. So I think a big part of what a lot of, a lot of people, especially the moms who are at home, what do we do at home? We're cooking, we're cleaning, we're thinking, oh my gosh, we have to make everything great for the kids and our spouse when they come home. But what about you? How have you advanced yourself as a wife, as a mother, as you know, this figure in the community? So it's, it, you know, it's a two-way street always. The husband is out working and he's trying to do his part. He may not be an active part in the children's life, which he should be. I'm not saying he's doing it right, but we have seen a lot of people don't do that. But us as, as moms then, or even if the dad is a stay at home dad, he has to, or we have to empower ourselves, know what's going on, know what social media, know what's happening in the world. You know, AI is here now. How many of us actually go out and learn or advance? We are parents, you know, like um, 10 years ago, and we are like, okay, that, that's the same parenting skills. I'm going to break 10 years later. I'm sorry, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. Um, okay, so the time now, guys, is 12.04. We started at 12.04. If you guys want to stay on, you can. We can. We can stay on a few more minutes. If anybody have any other questions, um, uh, a couple of things before I go to Iman is this is an ongoing um, discussion. Okay, I don't want this discussion to end here. I want you guys to send us your questions, send us your feedback, and also know that we have created an amazing, amazing amount of uh, workshops communication workshops, conflict resolutions, bullying. I mean, we have like 12 um, workshops that we have already created and we want you to come to learn. Like, you know, we we'll, we we have workshops that we talk about these matters that we're talking about. How, what are the solutions? How are we gonna fix it? So when you do see those workshops pop up, 
communications, um, you know, fixing double standards. Don't worry about what people think. Please, please sign up for that if you need it. Okay, it's very important. All right, I'll go ahead. And also Sadaf and her team are doing a lot of presentations everywhere in the community. Sadaf, go ahead and talk about what you're doing a minute and then Iman mm -hmm. will be there and then we can inshallah, um, if anybody else doesn't have any question, we can close off. Go ahead, Sadaf. So we have family nights planned. On June 16th, we have a family night at Hamza Masjid, which we're gonna talk about communication, active listening, <clears throat> and basically give the community tools to have better communication with their children, with their spouse, uh, with their friends, because communication is in all aspects. Um, and then we have one coming up on the 23rd at Sabreen. We have, um, we're working on one at Maria Masjid on July 14th. So every month, we're going to have different family nights in different locations. We're going to go to Bear Creek, Champions Masjid, all the different masjids in um, in Houston. And also, we're going to have workshops. <clears throat> so the presentations are just like a one-hour synopsis, an overview, a summary of basically everything. The workshops are going to be more detailed. So once you attend a presentation, you like the work, you want to hear more or learn more techniques, then we will have workshops at Anissa Hope Center. Um, so we're also <clears throat> going to be going to schools, middle schools and high schools to talk about um, different things like bullying and different topics that the schools want, um, mostly Islamic schools. So inshallah, we have a lot planned because we want to bring solutions to the community for a problem that is growing. And it's sort of the divide is actually causing a big, um, you know, we're losing, we're losing the young people from becoming leaders, from becoming, uh, you know, from leading us. Um, they should be the ones who are leading us. We shouldn't be the ones leading them anymore, you know, and we don't see that happening. So by fixing our communication, learning about conflict resolution, becoming better parents, becoming better people, inshallah, we can encourage our children to take the lead. And, and also one other part, the ISGH Women's Committee, who is led by Azima, they are also doing um, these presentations at each of their um, centers. So mm -hmm. look for those because uh, we go out, we talk, other people, other organizations go out, but we share the important information that you all need and you know that we all need actually. So I'll go ahead and ask Iman to, she has her hands up for a while. Go ahead, Iman. Um, just wanted to bring up this uh, issue of splitting personality. It really comes from shame. And so it's because of emotional abuse. And this, uh, the, the child that you're raising will grow up to become emotionally abusive to others. So, and they have split personality. They have a personality that uh, people like and the other personality that they don't like, he, the, the person hides them, whether the woman or man. So the only way for us to, uh, deal with this issues to break that shame cycle. Please educate yourself mm -hmm. about shame cycle. And also uh, one way to break out of that shame cycle is to come out and talk about how you feel. Yeah. How and, yeah. and that's how the, 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 the shame will go down and you get to accept yourself and feel safe being yourself. Excellent point. Also, we mm -hmm. have um, a, a counseling department at Anissa. We have eight uh, counselors. Um, we have youth counseling, Fiza and Crystal are, are specialized in youth counseling. Tahira, um, she supervised the counselors and she does marital counseling. So we have a lot of stuff going on. You need help, please, please message us, info at anissa.org. Even if you need to discuss anything we discussed here today. Okay, inshallah. I thank you all, Jazakallah Khair, for coming on and be, you know, staying with us for this hour. Inshallah, next month, I'm going to send out a feedback and we'll give some um, topics and we'll, whatever the majority chooses will be our next, next month's topic, Inshallah. Okay. Thank and please all. know that we've listened to everybody and every all of your suggestions were amazing. And we will definitely take them into account when we work on our curriculums and our solutions. So please stay in touch and continue to give the feedback you're giving. Thank Safra, you. any last closing? Okay. I'm just going to so, suggest. Um, we have, sorry, 
Sorry, I'm gonna give me one second. Um, so we have a couple things in the chat. So a lot of people were asking about how to reach out to our mental health professionals. So if you log on to our website, anissa.org, you'll be able to find all of the information on how to get in touch with our mental health professionals as well as schedule any appointments that you may need. Um, keep up with us on Instagram and on Facebook. So um, we have a couple questions asking about the family network. So all of those will be posted on our Facebook and our Instagram. So if you guys follow us at Anissa Houston, you'll be able to keep up with all of those updates as well. Thank you, Safra. Brother Muktadar, you want to go ahead and close out? Yeah, I was just going to suggest a dua. Yes, uh, Somebody else wants to do it, please feel free. You go Another. ahead, brother. You're the best. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا ملك يا قدوس يا سلام يا مؤمن يا محيم يا جبار المتكبر أنت الخالق وأنت البارئ وأنت المصور يا قهار يا عزيز يا غفار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم رب جعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذرية ربنا تقبل دعاء ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا ذرياتنا قرة عيون وجعلنا للمتقين إماما رب ارحمهما كما رب ياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما رب ياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما رب ياني صغيرا يا الله we ask you for your mercy رب العالمين يا الله we ask you to forgive our sins يا الله those that we have done knowingly and unknowingly يا رب العالمين يا الله our children يا الله we ask you to guide them to the صراط المستقيم يا الله guide all of us to the صراط المستقيم يا الله يا الله the difficulties every parent here faces in in uh, raising their children, Ya Allah, make ease for each and every one of us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make them the future of this Ummah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, protect them from any haram, Ya Allah. Protect them from harm, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make them great Muslims in the future, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, protect our progeny, Ya Allah. Keep them in the Surat Al Mustaqim. Ya Allah, our children, our children's children and their children until the day of judgment, keep them in the Surat Al Mustaqim, Ya Allah. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت واستغفرك وأتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصب اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم آمين يا رب العالمين سق الله خير okay السلام عليكم everyone thank you all for joining السلام عليكم